Folks, it's Tuesday night. You know what that means. Murder Hobo Inc. is live with Between the Rolls, our show what kind of passes for a talk show. Uh, this evening, we're doing a specialty show. It's with the educators, the people who are going to teach the youth uh, how to play D&D in their school system. We are super stoked about that, uh, and I am not kidding, because this is going to be a great show. I'm not going to have to talk a lot. I'm going to put these folks uh to the task and let them explain how they created their show uh and their groups uh so tonight is going to be them getting to brag about it uh but again all four of you thank you again very much for joining us we certainly appreciate it folks at home folks watching later follow us on twitch follow us on twitter take a look at our youtube archive if you want to buy some rpg <coughs> swag it's down i think it's below me uh Let's go ahead and start with introductions. Uh, you guys know how we do this show. Uh, first off, to my left, uh, I believe it's Danielle. Danielle, who are you? Where are you from? And who do you teach? Please. Hi, my name is... Oh, sorry. There you go. Uh, my name is Danielle Powell. I am from Nashville, Tennessee. I teach at a school called Curry Ingram Academy, and I teach middle school, so fifth through eighth grade. Very good. Uh, below her, RJ. RJ, same question. I don't have a lot of originality. It's all right. Nor do I. Uh, my name is RJ Cresswell. I am a middle school teacher. I teach grades six through eight. I am an art teacher and I live in central Texas. Very good. Across from RJ, we have Ruth. Ruth, your turn. Hi, I'm Ruth Copping. I teach in New Carlisle, Quebec in Canada, and I teach any grade really. This year is seven, eight, and 10. Thank you. Last but not least, Stuart. Hey, how you going? Uh, my name's Stuart. I'm from regional South Australia. I'm a high school teacher, so I teach years 8 through 12. Uh, I teach media studies predominantly, but I also teach English and history as well. Very good. And each one of you has your own D&D group at your schools, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Outstanding. Whew, boy, that was close, folks, because if I would have screwed it up, uh, you never would have let me forget it. Uh, you know what? We're, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing as we always do. We're going to start with a recap on the Saturday show, but uh, because these guys are giving us their time, it's going to be a short recap. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, and my apologies, we don't have it uploaded to YouTube yet. Uh, I was busy. Uh, it will be there this evening. Uh, it was Scott's first time in the DM chair, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> it's different. Uh, Scott will be the first one to tell you that... Uh, sitting behind a screen is much different than sitting on the screen with Twitch. Uh, unfortunately, he had Kyle, Ernie, and I, as well as our newest player, uh, Kelly, uh, who, if you remember Willa from episode 19, small world, it's her brother. Uh, the four of us uh, did our best to try to play D&D, I guess. Uh, but uh, I was victimized, even though I was a rogue. Uh, it's a good show. Uh, when I get it uploaded, when I get off my butt, you can take a look at it on our YouTube archive. It's still up on Twitch, will be for a few weeks. Uh, take a look at it. Uh, give Scott, to, to shoot Scott a tweet, tell him he did a nice job, and uh, it was his loss that he had such moronic players. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, let's move on to what we're here for, educators. Uh, like I said, these guys have all created their own D&D &D group at school. Uh, they are indoctrinating the youth of the world, uh, which is a good thing in this case. I myself uh, started very early in life playing it. Well, early then. Uh, I'm an old man now. Uh, but I have always felt that there were a lot of positive benefits to playing D&D. &D. And I'm not going to hog the spotlight because that's not my job. These guys are going to give their opinions on that, uh, and we're going to go ahead and discuss it. So we'll start off, uh, and we're going to go ahead and start off with Danielle for question number one. Inspiration. Uh, were you a player before? Uh, did you get hooked into this job? How did you say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and create this? Um. I was only, when I first started my first D&D &D club, it was at a different school, and I'd only been playing for about a year and a half, maybe. I was, I'm a noob at the time, and uh, the principal came up to me and said that their original DM had, or club sponsor had, had left, and he asked if I would take the club, um, 
I didn't realize it was about 15 seventh and eighth grade boys in a <laughs> behind the stage um, who had never seen a girl play anything that had to do with tabletop RPGs. And I had never done this before. So I kind of got thrown into the deep end from the very beginning. Um, half the club quit. Long story short, it's been like seven years now. And I have a different club that's much more organized and, and very follow through. And um, now I actually let the kids do most of the GMing. And I'm just kind of there as a facilitator for a lot of it. Very good. Uh, RJ, how about you? What was your inspiration Oh, well, let's see. I myself have been playing Dungeons and Dragons since 1993 or so. So I guess that's about 26 years. I started when I was in high school. I had a group of friends. So I've been playing for a really long time, not just Dungeons and Dragons, but other other games. And, um, you know, I started teaching middle school with these kids and I just I saw the opportunity that we might be able to start a club. And uh, it was me and a couple of the other electives teachers. Uh, I was more into Dungeons and Dragons, but they were into things like Magic the Gathering. And we just had this idea for kind of like this multi-game club. And we came together, kind of spitballed some ideas and uh, wrote up a proposal for our principal. And uh, they accepted it. They allowed us to do it. So we have this kind of rather large club where you know some of the students are mostly interested in card games like magic the gathering or pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or those type things some of them really just dig uh tabletop games but uh i mostly run D, &D so i'm kind of like the D, D club sponsor gotcha ruth what about you i've only played for about two years and last year i thought there was a few kids that kind of just wanted to hang out in like my room there's only about four or five of them so i started it i've only ran a few sessions but i want to try and get it going closer to the beginning of the year this year and see if i can get more into it and so they can gm and i don't have to <laughs> now has your school year not started the kids haven't come in yet no has has the everybody else started the kids haven't okay has everybody else got their kids yet or no mm. i have yeah i mean it's yeah. australia yeah. we're in the middle of the year here well, that's okay. <laughs> uh, Stuart, we're up There's to you so now. There's so many kids. Um, uh, yeah, so we started the club. I started the club about four years ago at my school. Um, I had, I've only been playing D&D for about five years. Um, I played Vampire the Masquerade when I was in high school quite a bit, um, but hadn't picked up any role-playing games since then. Uh, and my brother came around with his, uh, uh, I think it's the Red Box from like, the eighties and we played it with his kids and being a big nerdy teacher, I'm like, this would be great in the classroom. Uh, and then got hooked on it and played it all the time. And as a way to sort of, I, my goal was to use D and D in the classroom and to convince, uh, some of my managers and my principal that that would be a really good idea. I wanted to show them the benefits. So I started the club. Um, so it's been great. We meet every second week. Um, and there it's growing every year, you know, um, kids are really getting into it. Got about 25 kids that come and they all play D and D and now I don't run any games. They seem to run them all themselves, which is awesome. Man, you're getting ahead of me on the outline here. I put a lot of, oh, sorry. <laughs> you're sorry. fine. You're fine. Um, so I, I'm going to assume that it's been, uh, accepted positively for the most part, certainly yeah. by the students, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. does it, does anybody have any issues with, uh, fellow teachers? Uh, I, I will use the term religious nuts. Um, because I, I grew up in the eighties when I, I was destined to commit, uh, mass genocide and, uh, all sorts of witch like, uh, things. Uh, my parents were not that way. So they let us did that hoping that maybe we'd get arrested and out of their hair. I'm not sure, but, uh, but have any of you had any problems with, uh, somebody, anybody in your group? Uh, RJ, we'll start with you this time. Uh, so negative experiences with it so far. No, I've been doing it for a few years 
And as far as the administration, I've kind of had administration switch a couple of times since I've been doing this and every incoming principal has been very supportive of it. You know, I just kind of pitch it to them, you know, for what it is. And I tell them what can be the positive benefits of it. And none of them have ever shot me down on it. You know, so I've been fortunate enough not to experience that as far as other teachers go on my campus. Uh, haven't had any issues with that either. In fact, I've had, you know, some teachers offer to give us materials, not specifically for Dungeons and Dragons, but one of the teachers, her husband was done playing magic and just donated, you know, magic the gathering cards to us and stuff. So, uh, no, quite the opposite. You know, I found that uh, uh, people have been pretty supportive of our club. They see the amount of students that are coming to it and how excited they get about it. And there, there hasn't been any issues. Now, there could be, you know, potentially some guardians who don't want their students going, and maybe that's why they don't come to our club, but that's only speculation. That's nothing that I've ever heard or experienced or anything like that. It's just, it's, it's been a non-issue for me, and that's been pretty awesome. Excellent. Ruth, how about you? Any negatives? Staff has been fantastic. They don't quite understand it, but they're like, do whatever you want in your classroom. I had one student come to one session and came the next day and said he wasn't allowed to come back. His parents said that he wasn't allowed to. But that's the only, which is too bad because he was into it. And that is sad, especially, uh, you know, you get something that excites a kid and yeah. for them to get shot down, it's, uh, it's just bad all the way around. Uh, yeah. But at least there's only been the one. So, yeah. uh, Stuart, what do you think? Detractors? No, uh, not at all. Uh, I've, ha I've had one student that said that they aren't allowed to come uh, because of religious reasons, which is a little unusual. Australia's, I mean, we don't have the same sort of uh, strong religious um, thinking here in Australia. Um, but aside from that, everyone's been really supportive. Uh, we're in a, like a small country town where football reigns supreme and it, everyone is happy uh, to for kids that, to have an opportunity to be involved in something that isn't sport for those kids that don't play sport or don't want to play sport. And it's even better when we get some of the kids that do play sport coming along uh, because it breaks down those um, stereotypes, which is cool. And last but not least, Danielle. Um, actually, I've had the opposite. Um, I haven't had any kids that have not I actually worked at a Catholic school and I had girls join the club because their parents told them to uh said hey I played this as a kid you should go join that club too um that were scared to do it when it was just 15 boys and then you know girl GM it was a little more comfortable to join in the current school I met I have kids with um like learning differences and stuff so it's more actually encouraged I asked the parents to let the kids take it and so I have a lot of kids join the club to help with social abilities and just kind of interacting with other people and just having an outlet as well, just to, you know, if you're not into sports and you're not into that, or if you just want something different and to tell a story. So I've had the opposite of not wanting to do it. That's good. I, I, I am actually rather ecstatic uh, and sorry, Ruth, that you had the one bad experience. I'm actually rather ecstatic that the hobby is, way more accepted uh, than it used to be. Again, I'm a thousand years old, but growing up in the 80s in a small town in uh, Midwest America, uh, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> I knew I should have sacrificed their dogs, uh, but that's neither here nor there. So uh, Ruth, we're gonna start with you on this next question. Uh, and I, I kind of, well, you know what, let's, let's back up for one quick question. Uh, when you start your group, uh, Ruth, do you have them sign permission slips or do you put out like a uh, pamphlet or something to the parents to say, hey, <clears throat> this is what we're doing uh, and, and this is what it entails? Or do you just say, hey, let's play D&D? &D? And this, this will be the question for everybody. My school is kind of different. I'm in a very small school. There's only like 150 kids from pre-K to grade 11. And I've taught most of them for years, so I know the parents and I know which kids would be interested. So I kind of like invite the kids that I know would want to. I don't really, I don't, I haven't sent anything home. I haven't, nothing like that. But no, <clears throat> uh, aside from the one uh, student, no negative feedback. No. 
Okay. Now my 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 the, my staff just thinks I'm like the weird teacher that's into <laughs> weird things in video games, and they just like let me go because it's very small. Like hunting is the big thing here, like farming, hunting, fishing. So there's a lot of kids that don't understand. So like the kids that I know aren't into the hunting and the fishing and everything, those are the ones that I try to get involved in in the different things that I do. You got to know your audience. Yeah. I, I mean, if a kid's interested in racquetball and that's his entire life, maybe he does, maybe that takes up a lot of his time. Uh, Stuart, same question. How do you prep the kids slash parents guardians? Uh, well, I'm uh, very much the same as Ruth. Uh, I've sort of, I, at the start, I targeted kids that I knew were interested because I was always talking about D&D in class. The kids that showed that interest, I invited them. Um, but now I send home permission slips. I put in a note notice into our new school newsletter. Um, and sometimes I put like a Facebook post up. And the way that I do that is like a little description, something that you would read out of an adventure. And then it's as a bit of a hook to get people reading it and then explain what D&D is and tell them when it's on and, and kids can come and get consent forms from me. Uh, we have to have consent forms because it's after hours. So it's, so um, kids, parents, kids need to be picked up by their parents. So cool. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, sorry. <laughs> you are up. Okay. Um, mine is actually through, I'm lucky enough to have an after care, after care program that actually supplies the clubs and that kind of thing. So every, all the permission slip and everything is already taken care of. I write up a blurb, they put it on the website and then maybe in the talkative teacher that I am talk about it in every single class I have. Um, it's become the most, one of the most popular clubs in the middle school. So at this point in time, it's the kids telling other kids, bringing more kids. So it's word of mouth more than anything else at this moment. But, and the parents are uh, so now, do they sign off like a blanket permission slip? Like, Oh, this is summer camp. You know, as long as my kid doesn't come home with an arrow in the eye, I'm fine with that. Or, uh, yeah, that's it's through Boost, which is an after ap, our aftercare program. So as soon as they sign them up for Boost, they're pretty much automatically able to do any of the after school clubs. Oh, that's that's convenient. So, uh, RJ, what about you? Uh, well, you know, you kind of mentioned uh, you know being a kid in the '80s and stuff like that, and I was you know I was around during that time as well, and kind of experienced a bit of the the satanic <laughs> panic uh, kind of thing uh, in the sense that when I first started role playing, my mom wouldn't actually let me play Dungeons and Dragons. You know, I had to start off with games that were not Dungeons and Dragons, and then kind of like get my mom into the idea of I'm playing role playing. It's no big deal. So when I first started doing this club, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to be doing Dungeons and Dragons. Talking to my principals, uh, do I need to send home permission slips? And they were like, nope. The parents will just let their kids come or they won't, you know, and that's all you got to deal with. And uh, in terms of this school year, it's a little different than previous school years. I actually have 30 minutes of Dungeons and Dragons every single day built into the school day that the kids can come to. And, you know, it's it's the parents aren't even factored into the equation. The kids just get to choose to come or not, you know, so, so good. you know, uh, yeah, we just started that this week and I have. 30 something students that come see me that will be coming to see me every single day for D and D. So I don't know how I'm going to manage them yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, but uh, so I don't even need permission slips for that. I'm still going to continue to do my after school club. And while I've never done permission slips before, uh, I'm intending to send them home for kind of the same reason Stuart was mentioning, you know, I'm going to be staying with them an hour, hour and a half after school. And I just want to have some parent contact information, you know, but uh, but yeah, I've never really had to do them. I'm just, I'm choosing to do them. And uh, to follow up with the last thing, you know, uh, I forgot to mention this particular parent when you asked the last bit of the question, but I, I've literally had a parent come into my classroom, see my Dungeons and Dragons poster and be like, my kid's going to join your group, you know? Uh, so, so again, positive support, you know, all that stuff. Okay. I'm pretty sure the other three want to know the answer to this question. And I know I do. How did you convince your school to allow you to have a 30 minute session during school hours to get that done? Am I, am I right or am I wrong on that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I got to tell you that was, that was none of my doing really. 
Um, last year, my administrators had looked at another school in Texas as kind of like this model for a program. We call it uh, just kind of like, you know, their power hour or something like that. And it's just basically an hour built into the day where they get to do something that's that's non-academic. I mean, they can do academic stuff during that time as well. But uh, so I, I, I could do an hour of Dungeons and Dragons if I wanted to, but I love Dungeons and Dragons. I love comics. So I, I split mine up into a D and D club for 30 minutes and then a creating comics club for 30 minutes. But uh, to answer your question, I didn't convince anybody to do that. My administrators want to do it. They wanted to do it. And they just ask faculty members, you know, what clubs would you like to sponsor if you would like to sponsor a club? And I was like, D and D comics, you know? So, so now, now that 30, the 30 minute session is that, <laughs> so if I wanted to do French club or cooking club or something like that, I, I would go there, but instead you offer a D and D club. Exactly. There are oh, lots okay. of, there are lots of things that they can choose to do. Uh, but as I said, I've got about 30 something that have chosen to come to D and D and they're all super stoked about it. Excited about it. Cool. Uh, next question. We'll start off with Stuart. Uh, your club makeup. Uh, easy question. Do you DM? Did you start DMing? And now you move to the kids DMing. Um, so essentially it started with me DMing. Um, I got some interest in who wanted to play and then some interest in who wanted, might be interested in running games. And I got about six kids that were keen on running games. So for one term, I, I just did the club with those kids and we ran in, I ran them through some adventures, league adventures. Um, and then at, after we finished them, I gave them the adventures to have a read of and, and look through and just, we talked about DMing in general and got them on to DM YouTube channels and then the following term um, invite opened it up to everyone and we got about 20 kids to come and so we had ended up with three or four tables that were run by students um, and then I step in and run games when kids if kids are away um, and now there's one other teacher who comes with me as well who DMs sometimes so really it's just the kids I mean for the first year it was pretty it was pretty labor intensive because um, I was doing a lot of the to DMing. So it would be a, uh, a teaching day all day. Usually on a Wednesday, I'd be teaching all day and then rush to the library and spend two hours DMing. Um, so that was getting tiresome, but now, now the kids are running it themselves. So yeah, I don't have to do much. Just occasionally I'll drop in and run something for them. Or if the, if they're, if they're DMs away and they really don't want to miss the story, I'll, we'll do character creation or we'll just look through the books or we'll do something else. Danielle, I know you started with a bunch of boys. Uh, how has that progressed? Um, so it started out with a bunch of boys. Two thirds of them quit when they found out that I was new and I was going to keep it very, very structured because I was like, you're going to take your turn, then you, then you, then you, and then you. Because um, when I went in, it was just chaos and not even organized chaos. So once I had like a plan, set everything in motion, I lost the majority and then gained a whole bunch of really, really good kids at the other school. Um, at the school I'm currently at now, I just had this past year, had the kids GM for me. Uh, we split the group in half and I had two girls GM a game together as co-GMs and then I did my game. And then we would switch the group every week. We would do a different group. Following that, I had a kid who spent literally the entire first semester planning a dungeon and some dragons campaign with like he hand drew the, the dungeon and created the monsters and put everything in and just had the storyline all like planned out into like this novel of a book and so i said okay when january comes these are your kids and i'm going to do star wars and then we would switch the groups again so i've kind of lucked out and had kids who have been very you know gung-ho about it well, it's nice to have proactive kids because uh, they take care of themselves for the most part or technically should. RJ, what do you think? Uh, so in terms of like, you know, whether or not kids DM or I DM, mm -hmm. um, usually when I start out the club, I'll be a little more hands-on and, you know, I'll DM kind of like little scenarios for them and things like that. And uh, a lot of the first several sessions is just kind of me teaching them. Some of them have played before and many of them have not. Uh, last year, I think I the way I did the club is for about half of the year, 
I just kind of like worked with them on just calling it like different scenarios and DMing for them. And after the winter break, I turned it over to them, you know, kind of, I like, I did their first adventure and then I said, okay, after I do this one, I'm going to turn it over to y'all. And each week I want a different person to DM and you'll know you're going to be DMing the next week and you'll be able to prep for it and things like that. So kind of a mixture, uh, this year, having that class of, of 30 students, I'm going to try to hand it over to them as quickly as possible because I can't obviously manage 30 players at a time. So I've got them broken up into four different tables and I'm just going to run a couple of scenarios with them. This is how we play. You've got your characters. Here's going to be your DM at your table. And then I'm going to turn it over to them as quickly as possible. I will probably provide them with some modules uh, that they can do. We've got the, all the starter sets. So they'll have those adventures to choose from. And we'll probably start with those modules you are an old guy <laughs> almost <laughs> almost nobody says that anymore and i, and yeah. I love that because that's how i grew up as well ruth what do you think um i've dm'd all the games that i played with the kids but again it was only about half the year last year that i started it but this year once we get going i'd like to have them do it because i'm not overly comfortable dming so i'd like one of them the more creative ones to be able to to take over no like one is they come in to talk to them <laughs> yeah no one is ever completely comfortable dming i've been yeah. doing this 100 years and every time that show starts it's like you guys are gonna make me hate you uh but yeah i i i think turning it over to the kids is probably a wise choice because um kids always always surprise you uh i do uh some training during the summer uh, for kids at the summer camp. And I am always amazed at the creative outlet uh, that they abuse on a regular basis. And it's, it's nice to watch that because when you work with adults all the time, it's like the greatest thing you did today was go grocery shopping. <laughs> and uh, the kids will be like, ah, oh, you know, I thought about doing this. And it's like, Take this pen and write that down. Uh, now, the next question, I believe we're to Danielle, right? If I get lost, uh, we'll make it up. But, um, <clears throat> oh, okay. So most of you have answered this already, but I just kind of like to go a little bit more in depth on that. With respect to groups, uh, how many kids do you have and how many groups do you have in there? And how often do you switch off, if at all? So Danielle, floor is yours. Uh, my club usually ends up with about 11 or 12. I, am, I teach in the middle school, so we only have 100 something kids. Um, so it's not a huge club, but I usually depends on, depending on the kids, I usually split them into two groups. I ask them what they wanna play. We play the <clears> options. <throat> we have about six different systems we can use that they know how to play. We usually start with Fantasy Age by Green Ronin because it's the easiest for them to do dice-wise. It's simpler than a D20. Um, and then I decide who goes into what group, and then we usually end up switching it. The original plan last semester was for one group to do 5th edition with my student GM and for me to do Star Wars, but they all wanted to do Star Wars. So it ended up every week. Oh, we would... And then as the it. semester went back, <laughs> and then as the semester went on, um, the two groups of the two separate Star Wars groups actually ended up meeting in the middle and they had an adventure together. Like their two groups met on like a, you know, and so it was a fun way for them to end. And the kid who did the fifth edition had a blast because every week he had new kids. So challenge accepted. Very nice. RJ, what do you think? Oh yeah. So in terms of how many groups and kids I have, like I mentioned, I've got that class and it's, I haven't counted it yet because I've only been working with them for a few days, but uh, it's 30 something. I don't know exactly. And I've got them split up into four different tables in my room. And uh, the way that I'm intending to do it, uh, as I've said, is just have a DM at every single table, you know, as soon as possible running their own adventures. And they'll all kind of like, it's at least fixed for the first six weeks. So there will be a solid four groups, you know, at each of those tables for the first uh, six weeks of school. And um, I haven't done my first after school uh, session yet, but last year, I think my first session, I ended up having 50, 54 students show up. Now, I didn't DM them all at the same time, but I did like coward, a rotation. Coward, coward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, but I did a road like three rotations or something like that and ended up with, you know, huge tables and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, in terms of the after school program, I'll see different students throughout the school year, but I'll have the same core of like nine to 10 students who will always show up for it. Ruth. I only had five kids, so we had one table. <laughs> hey, that <laughs> trust me. That is not a bad thing. Because <laughs> no. uh, no. I listening to RJ, I'm like, holy shit, yeah. 30 kids. Uh, so now, uh, do you have somebody that you've got your eye on to take over the mantle of DMing, or are you just going to let them fight it out a la Star Trek style? That would be fun. Got to play the music, though. You got to have the yeah. music. I'm going to wait to see who comes back this year. And then kind of talk to them all to see who wants to and if they want to rotate. I like the rotation idea of a different one every week. Now, when will you get your kids again? Um, high school. I've been, I'm in an elementary and high school. So high school doesn't come in until Friday. Oh, well, very nice. Um, yeah. And Stuart, what do you think on the table rotation groups? Um, well, at the moment, we've got three regular groups and occasionally four. Uh, they keep the same DM for now. Um, just because they're happy doing that. Uh, but, sorry. Man, <laughs> Man alive, that is annoying. <laughs> he's sorry, fine. That's my dog. That's my dog. That's Kevin. He's going to jump up in a minute and you all get to meet him because he's really annoying. Um, hello. This is Kevin. How you doing? Um, so they're running their own, but next year, most, most of the people that are running games at the moment are senior students and they are leaving at the end of the year so uh the next the rest of the year is training dm so we're i think i'm gonna do the alternate dm style i think i think that sounds really good now for those of you who use the alternate dm style uh do you maintain uh sandbox style uh since doing a linear adventure would be counterproductive i guess uh Stuart, what do you think on that um, it depends. I would probably run it with separate adventures and for new DMs, I'd get them onto Adventurers League adventures. The, um, I think it's season five of Adventurers League was Storm King's Thunder and that's really well written and easy to follow. So for young kids, I'll get them started with that. Uh, Danielle, what do you think? I usually give them a module to you. Nice, uh, nice, nice phrasing. Nice phrasing. <laughs> well, uh, I actually had last year, I started a Titan's Grave at the beginning of the year. Edited, an edited Titan's Grave, so no beer baron or anything like that. Um, and then handed it off to the girls and said, okay, go. Um, obviously, with the kid who did fifth edition, he designed the entire thing on his own. So I just said, you know, you go, dude. Um, for me, though, mine are always linear. And they seem to remember it every week. They like having the idea that when they come back next week, they can continue their adventure and their story. So, RJ, what about you? Sandbox yeah. or linear? Uh, in the previous years, well, at least when I DM for them, it's more of a sandbox kind of thing. You know, these <laughs> these kids are just starting out, and there's nothing they can throw at me that I want to expect. You know, so I just kind of let them do what they want to do, and we follow the adventure that they want to give. Uh, I want to have. Uh, I will throw some prompts out to them, and like give them kind of like some things that they can pick at in case they can't decide what they want to do. Um, but in terms of kind of like uh, when the students were DMing. Uh, I kind of like did the adventure to start them off and then they just came up with a story that they thought should follow that, you know? So I guess it was kind of linear in that sense that they were, they were trying to follow the story that I started for them, you know? That's so. fair. Ruth, uh, linear or sandbox? I think I would go linear also find an adventure that they would want, that they would be interested in and let them, let them all read through it and kind of go from there. So, let me ask you this because obviously murder hobo Inc is just <laughs> chaos unleashed. Uh, Ruth, do you find any of your players just like to hop the rails or are they all pretty much a herd animal where they'll follow the carrot? They'll follow the carrot. If I put, when I, I put something in front of them and they were just like, okay. And like little lemmings, they all went after it. Now, uh, 
did you notice any difference by the end of the year? Not really. I did, we didn't play enough because we only played for a couple of months before exams and finals started and everything, and that kind of cut into that. So they didn't really get a chance to kind of get their feet under them with the with how to play. It was a lot of baby stepping and them learning because they'd never seen a game, they'd never played a game. So it was completely brand new to all of them last year. That's fair. Uh, Stuart, uh, you got any murder hobos in your group or are they all pretty much good soldiers? Uh, you know, depends which group it is, but um, 14 year old boys and dice, uh, they go wherever they want. They're pretty good though, but like uh, I ran, uh, one of the DMs was away this week and so I ran a group through uh, one of my adventures and they went right, right off the rails, spent 25 minutes dealing with something that should have been two minutes. Hmm. Were they on my show? <laughs> <laughs> Candidates uh, for the future, maybe. <laughs> Danielle, what do you think? But no, they go off the rails. Just nice. That. <laughs> and um, now, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, when they go off the rails, do you find that they're more creative or less creative? more creative. Um, we talk about having to do improv a lot in a game. Um, and we've actually Skype called a couple, um, actual professional gamers out in Los Angeles and they keep reiterating, you need to have improv skills. You need to be able to go with the flow. So I think my kids like to test me on that. Hmm, um, yeah, weird. It's a little <laughs> weird, strange, unusual. No, they, they, they like the story and they like coming to it, but they never, they, they like to go their own way to get there. I share your pain. RJ, what do you think? Oh, well, you know, they, uh, some of them definitely go off the rails occasionally. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about one of the sessions last spring that I did with them. And I think I had about a group of 14 kids in that particular game, after school game. And uh, at some point, you know, uh, they had kind of been given some prompts that they could do. And one of them, it was kid playing a barbarian. He was like, you know, we could do this or we could just take over the town you know? And I was like, well, you can certainly try, you know? <laughs> so uh, they come up with ideas like that and, and definitely want to do their own things. And I'm okay with that, you know? Very good. Uh, I think we're starting with you again, RJ, because I think we started with Danielle. But again, if I'm screwing this up, my apologies. Uh, session zero. Uh, you see it a lot uh, in discussion groups. You see it a lot on uh Twitter feeds. Oh, you know, you got to do a session zero. Oh, you don't need to do a session zero. You can just start right out of the gate. Uh, yay or nay? And if it's yay, how do you handle your session zero? Starting with RJ. Okay. So the first couple of years, I didn't really do session zeros because I didn't really know about it. I'd heard the term uh, floated around, but never really experienced it myself. Um, but after I kind of like learned about it, read about it. I've kind of used them for my own games as well. Um, but last year I did a session zero with the students. And this year, especially with that class of 30 students, I've told them this week, you know, yesterday or Monday, what, what is today? Yeah, y yesterday. Tuesday. Um, yeah. So yesterday I told them all week long is our session zero because I only have them for 30 minutes. So, you know, essentially we've kind of spent some time yesterday and today kind of like talking about how we're going to treat people and these are going to be the norms of our groups and stuff like that. And uh, then tomorrow we're discussing like races and backgrounds and stuff like that. And they're going to start kind of like piecemealing their characters together. And then by the end of the week, I'm hoping to have this workable character that we can begin playing with next week. And they'll kind of understand how to conduct themselves and the things, you know, that, that can be tolerated, you know, in this school environment, D and D group, and the things that can't be, you know. So, so I, I kind of have to do it with them. Well, you've got a ton of them, so yeah. Uh, now, on the flip side, Ruth has got a smaller group, which can be nice. Uh, Ruth, what do you think? Session zero. I did one with the kids just because they'd never played before, so it was like I went back to this is a D twenty, and everything starts with the D twenty and went over like this is what a blank character sheet looks like and then we worked at filling it in so i went like way back and then kind of baby stepped them through it and how did they receive it a couple of them got bored real fast but once they saw that they had like a character that they could then do do stuff with and hit stuff and stuff died they i got them back 
Well, at that age group, it's it can be difficult to go ahead and keep their attention. Um, Stuart, you're up. Um, start of the year, I do a session zero. Zero. Uh, I use D and D Beyond for character creation. Um, and sorry, I'm going to remove my dog in a second. Um, and he's no worse than Kyle or Blake <laughs> or any of the other murder hobos, so he's fine. So the new kids get to make characters there, and then if a new kid starts during the term, I just give them a pre-gen character, and if they like it, they can come to me the next day, and we'll make their own character, um, and they can just learn on the fly. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, Danielle? Okay, mine's a bit more complicated. That's fine. Uh, We're here to learn. I actually have been doing session zeros for a while and didn't realize it's what I was doing, but I guess it's the teacher in me. I organized my first club with a slideshow explaining what the different races are, the different classes, uh, the different attributes you have as you fill in your character sheet, what they mean. And then I also have a grid for rolling the dice, adding the numbers, and then as we're filling everything out, I actually have a worksheet that they fill in with color-coded blocks to tell them when you do the red, do the red section first, it goes here. Um, and then as a group, we have a, uh, they have a questionnaire they fill out about their character, what they want it to be. And then we talk as a group or a class or whatever it is about how they want the game to go. Do you want the game to be story-driven? Do you want it to be an adventure? Do you want, it, do you want to be a murder hobo? What's your plan for this? Why are you here? And then we pick and choose who wants to be where and with what group in accordance to how they want to play the game. So it takes usually like one or two sessions. It's, I didn't realize it was a session zero until recently when I was like, oh, I've, I've been doing that, I guess. But um, it also shows them how to play and it kind of keeps them within the, in the game and within the thing and also lets them know that what they're here for, while it's fun, it's still going to be structured. And it's still going to be structured time. We're not going to go crazy and just be insane. That's fair. Yeah, uh, the buzzword with session zero. Uh, okay, I, I I like it because, as you pointed out, it does provide a little bit of structure. Okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to frame this. Uh, when we created Murder Hobo Inc., I actually sent out a questionnaire to everybody saying, "Okay, this is what I envision." but this is a group project. Um, so while I am exuberant in my uh, talking, uh, it's still a group project. And uh, whether they call it a session zero or the right way to game or doing it logically, uh, I like it. Uh, and with you guys teaching kids, I, I would see a big value in showing them, you know, this is how you resolve issues um, because a lot of problem solving has gone by the wayside, um, at least with the guys I work with, uh, which is really weird. Uh, but I, I, I like the structure and I like the session zero because it makes sure that everybody is on the same page. Uh, we're going to take a sidestep here real quick. We have a question from the audience. Uh, Stranger Things phenomena. What do you think about that? Uh, has it helped you? Has it hurt you? Has it given unrealistic expectations? I think, are we at Ruth or are we at Stuart? I'm Ruth, I think. Ruth, go ahead. <laughs> We're putting you on the hot seat. What do you think about the Stranger Things phenomena? Uh, I haven't watched it and I'm not sure many in my area have, so it hasn't really affected any of the kids at my school. That's good. Yeah, that that it it offers them a clean slate. <laughs> Do they watch Critical Role at all? Nope. Okay. Stuart, same question to you. Critical Role, because uh, I'm going to tack in on that. Uh, critical Role... Mm -hmm. Um, Stranger Things uh, phenomenon. What do you think? I, I had a few of the senior kids because I teach media studies. I'm often going on about what's on TV and what's on Netflix and 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 Twitch streaming and all those sorts of things. Uh, so I definitely had some kids last year that came along to play D and D to check it out and see what it was all about. A few of which stayed for the rest of the year, which was awesome. Uh, a few of the younger kids watch Critical Role, but it's not really. It's, I find that's, uh, for me and, and the region that I'm in, that's a lot more to do with 
uh, older people that are playing D&D or at Adventurers League. Yeah. Danielle? Yes, actually. <clears throat> I actually had two girls who were playing uh, RPG and D&D with me before Stranger Things started. And then Stranger Things came out and they're like, oh my God, we do that. We, we do that. <laughs> <laughs> so they came to me and they just kind of whispered it to me they're like mrs powell can can we do a stranger things game and i was like well there's not a system but you know i got you i got you we can do this and so i homebrewed a game of stranger things for the next semester um and it ended up bringing in two or three other people who also had never seen it but they were able to jump into it they loved the idea of going to the upside down and having to find somebody and bring them back and fighting a Denny Gorgon, and they stayed with the club, and they're like, "This is the best thing ever." I was like, "Good, yeah. thank the girls." They decided they wanted to do this. They had like a Demi dog as like a pet. The dragon ate it, but they had it for like you know two sessions. It was there, um, and then so, you no, killed it. <laughs> nice. I was let her keep it. She knew this was going to happen. One of the other girls. The other girl decided her dragon was going to eat it and asked me permission. I was like, "Absolutely, it can totally do that." She's not keeping a Demi dog. I'm sorry. But it does have an it has an impact. It's brought in a couple kids. I don't think their expectations were ever at a level where they were like, oh, we have to play like them. They were just excited that they knew something and they had something in common with the show that they just fell in love with. Oh good. I, I, I like hearing that. Uh because it's nice to go ahead and transition over to pop culture and D D. Uh RJ, what do you think? How are things in Texas? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of my students like Stranger Things, and it's actually kind of been a way to to bond with some of my students because I like it as well. And uh, if any of you happen to have followed me on Twitter, you might have seen I was posting pictures a, a couple of weeks ago, ago about how I'm setting my classroom up as a Stranger Things kind of theme. And, you know, I just kind of like all the fonts that I did. I It's like Ben Guade or something like that is the name of the font. And I've just kind of made all of my signs out of that. And uh, I have a, a a sign with a picture of myself turned upside down, you know, with the kind of like Stranger Things font that says Mr. Cresswell's art class. And um, anyway, uh, I just kind of made all of those things. But yes, uh, as students have heard me say, you know, I sponsor this Dungeons and Dragons club, you know, hands shoot up immediately if they don't know it already. Is that the game they play on Stranger Things? And I'm like, yes, it sure is. And then not nearly excited. enough. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, but no, they, they get excited because of that. Some of them want to come play because of that in this, uh, class of like 30 that I have, you know, I've told them I've got these box sets I'm going to be giving out a few of which are stranger things. And I just had a girl from the class come to me today, you know, ask, asking, how can I get the stranger things box set? You know? Um, so yeah, they love stranger things and it's been positive for influencing them to want to play Dungeons and Dragons in some cases. Now, have you, have you looked at the stranger things edition? Yeah, yeah, I have. I've uh, read the. I, I have not. Uh, go ahead if if you can. Go ahead and give us a your take on it. I guess I would probably, if I were recommending a middle school student or a younger person, you know, starting out playing uh, D and D with one of the box sets, I would probably recommend that one for them because the adventure is pretty straightforward. It's simple. It's kind of old school style. It's, you know. I think it's a really neat little adventure. And if they're familiar with Stranger Things, you know, there is, you know, kind of some going in the upside down. It actually comes with uh, uh, a couple of the Demogorgon minis, you know. So, I mean, it's 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 not as complicated as the adventure, the, the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak uh, from the Essentials Kit or Lost Minds of Fandelver either. But uh, it's just a simple, straightforward adventure. It's fun. I think younger kids would definitely enjoy it. Very good. Has anybody else looked at it? Uh, Danielle Stewart or Ruth? Uh, no, yeah, but I got want it. A little oh. Demi Corgan. No, I just <laughs> want it. I want the little Demi Corgan. Uh, Stuart, what was your take on it? Uh, exactly the same. Yeah, I thought it was really uh, simple, easy to read, uh, big writing, um, a great little starter, really. Um, I was given it just the other day by one of the players. Uh, in my podcast, which was awesome. Um, so I haven't had a chance to play it as yet, but I've read through it and it's, um, yeah, it's a good little starter. Very good. Uh, Danielle, you need to check out our uh, mini painters show. Those guys can get you that Demogorgon and they can paint the crap out of it. Uh, I, when I used minis, uh, I had a very straightforward approach. Take the mini, take the can of spray paint, 
and make sure that layer was good and solid and bright, uh, which caused a few of them to grimace when I uh, made that revelation. I, I thought they were going to pass out. Uh, we are starting to get behind, as usual, because we never actually ever get through the uh, things. Um, there's, there's a couple of questions I really want to get covered here. I'm going to leave the extra stuff for your final thoughts. Um, okay, each one of you run a D&D &D club. Um, what is the one piece of advice you could go back in time and give yourself to make life easier on you? Stuart, you seem perplexed, so we're going to start with you. <laughs> uh just go for it. Uh, make sure you've got lots of dice. Make sure you've got some books on hand. Um, definitely spend some lunch times with kids going through what they're doing. Um, and just know that they will be, it will get off the ground. Like I was really, I got really nervous and upset because at one point uh, we went from like 20 kids one week and then the next week there was five. And for about a term we just had these same five kids coming um but now it's back up to 30 kids uh, 25 kids um and they're all getting something out of it so just start it pick some kids that you know want to do it and and get started very good danielle um i'm gonna say roll with the punches uh be super flexible with anything you have planned um, and read through the manual all, all the way, not just part of the way. <laughs> you mean the guidelines that they, they give? Just every. Just Whatever. Every. <laughs> Whatever it is in front of you, make sure you've read to the end, just, just in case they get there, like as a figure eight type thing. Understood. Yeah. Uh, RJ, what about you? Going back in time, because I love time travel. Well, um, as far as the previous, this year's just getting started. As far as the previous years go, I've had a pretty easy time of it in spite of some large numbers occasionally. Uh, but I guess if I had to choose one thing that I might have changed, it would be get the, get the kids DMing faster than I did, you know, because uh, when I got them DMing, I really saw them open up and it was great to see, it was great to see them uh, DM. Uh, in terms of this year, I haven't spent enough time with that group of 30 in a classroom. So ask me again in December and I'm sure I'll have a, a brand new uh, thing that I would have loved to have done differently, you know, cause I don't know how I'm, that's going to go yet. I'm told life is a learning experience. I'm not quite certain about that. Ruth step back a year. What would you tell yourself? As simply as you think you're explaining it, make it simpler. <laughs> That is that is fair. Uh, when yeah. I when I have to, when I have to tell somebody how to do something on the computer, I always imagine I'm standing next to my father, <laughs> and we're just going to walk it through. Uh, those are all good pieces of advice. Now, next one, uh, Danielle, start with you. I'm a teacher, and I want to do this. What are the first three things I need to do, in your opinion? Uh, because I'm like, I, I want to teach these kids. I want to get a group together. What are the three most important bullet points I need to hit to get this thing off the ground? Like Stuart said, it's going to fly. You just got to get it there. Top three things. Um, have dates, times, a schedule presented, ready to go. Explain how the time is going to be used. Uh, research, pull any kind of research you can find, especially if you're going to admin about it, about how it helps with learning and social skills. Uh, do, do some work and get in there and be like, here's this article and here's another article about how it helps kids. Um, and then I'd say for third, gauge the interest and have kids speak up. Like, talk to some kids and ask, if I'm going to do this, would you want to be interested in this club? And get some quotes from the kids saying, yes, I would like to do this and this is why I would like to do this or maybe possibly get the kids invested as well. Fair. Uh, RJ? 
Um, yeah, I mean, if you are a teacher and you're wanting to start your own club, I think you definitely, well, first you should know whether or not there's an interest, uh, um, uh, cause if you don't have students come, you know, uh, no dean starting the club. Um, but after that, you're going to have to start with the administrators and you're going to have to present it to them and see if they'll get on board with it. But I can't imagine going to an administrator and saying, would you like me to start this club that will hit on multimodal things of interdisciplinary studies? You know, I can pull in math. I can pull in science. I can pull in creative writing. I can pull in all of these other things. Uh, we can, you know, work on conflict resolution. We can work on problem solving. I can't imagine throwing all those things out there and not having an administrator being like, okay, I'll consider this, you know? So um, like was previously stated, yeah, do your research, you know, look at some of the benefits for it really sell it to your administrators. And then if you can get them on board with it, um, you know, at least in terms of my school and my district, if you're considering being a club sponsor and staying after school, uh, one of the things I know you have to do is you have to be CPR first aid certified. Cause if you're ever at school after hours with kids, you know, it becomes a liability issue. So you got to have your ducks in a row. You know, I can do this. I'm CPR certified, you know, uh, shouldn't be an issue on that front. And then after that, just kind of advertise, get students interested, you know, so. You don't just get to shock the kids with the pads whenever you feel like it? No, 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 not at all. I could never be a teacher. Uh, Ruth, what do you think? Top three things to get this thing off the ground. I would say do your research, but not just in how is it going to benefit the kids and how to actually play, because you need to, you need to be able to, to do it. Uh, I'm going more simply. I'm just saying, get your materials in, in order, get your dice, get your pencils, get your paper. If you're using D and D beyond, make sure you have computers in your classroom to do it with and just gauge the kids, get the kids that you know would be interested and get them to bring in more. Very good. Last but not least, Stuart. Um, basically what everybody else said, um, be prepared, speak to administration, let them show them the links. Um, and like RJ said, there's very few administration um, officials that will not turn that down. Um, and in my case, I even got some funding in the end. Um, my school gave me 500 bucks to spend on D and D stuff, which was really cool. So now we have a little D and D section in the library. Very nice. Um, yeah. Uh, RJ, you kind of stole the, this next question already and that's okay. Uh, I am an administrator. What, it, what is the one thing you could tell me that I'm going to say, well, heck yeah, let's do this thing. And I know you've covered it, but it's, it's well worth repeating. Go ahead, RJ. Okay. So yeah. Um, you know, an administrator is going to want to hear all of those things I said, you know, D and D is very, uh, multimodal. You'll be hitting on several things when you do D and D it also, you know, pulls in, uh, interdisciplinary stuff. Like I said, you can talk about dungeon ecology, you know, uh, yeah, obviously there's like that fast math that you'll be doing just all the time and constantly you're, uh, I had someone on Twitter phrase it to me like this and I'd never really heard it. You're working on shared narratives. You know, that's a term that I think administrators would like to hear as well. You know, so there are just so many different things uh, that, you know, uh, administrators will be looking for and stuff like that because they want to hear, you know, that if you're doing a club like that, it's going to be beneficial to students in some ways. So, again, that's what the administrators want to hear. So if you're a teacher and you're trying to pitch it to them, these things are true. You just got to you got to know to say it. You got to know to say the right things about it. Ruth, you've transferred. You've got me as your uh, boss. Why should I have you do this? It's a good way to get the kids that may be the outliers, the ones who might not be involved in the sports and the band and everything like that. It gives them something to do, keeps them out of trouble, gets them working on their math skills, their literacy skills, their cooperative skills. Just getting them involved in school. Very good. Stuart. Uh, what I said to my principal and what is on the consent form is that D&D &D is uh, collaborative storytelling that improves literacy, numeracy, critical and creative thinking um, and ethical understanding, uh, which are all terms that are in our, um, our uh, curriculum, uh, national curriculum. So when any of my line managers read that, like, oh, it ticks all the boxes. I'm like, yeah, and it's really fun. 
Uh, Danielle, uh, I, I know you got a bunch of murder hobos, so we could toss that ethical part out for you. <laughs> what are you going to tell your administrator? Hey, this is why we need to do this. I actually have notes right here. Um, so I have that the type of school I teach at has a lot of ADHD and a lot of kids on the spectrum. So I focus a lot on the social coaching, the social interaction, and the social skills building um, aspect of role playing. I also hit on the collaborative storytelling, um, attention to narrative and details, and that it's a safe place to experiment and try social interactions with kids that you don't usually interact with and kind of coming out of a shell if you're super shy or unsure. Uh, but the big one, the one that I use that always gets them is there's no screen time involved. Fair. That one gets the parents in and the parents <laughs> are now all about it. They're like, no screen time? I'm good. Cool. Let's do it. Fair enough. Uh, this one is also to all of you guys. I, I know we've, <laughs> we always run long on these shows and that's okay. Uh, we have a lot of people that watch this show, uh, you know, we aren't NBC or anything, but we've got a lot of people that uh, do the show. We've got a lot of dice makers. Uh, we've got a lot of content creators. Uh, a, what do you guys need to make your life easier? And B, do you have some kind of GoFundMe or website or something like that? Uh, we'll start with Daniel. Uh, because of the type of school I teach at, I can't do a GoFundMe or anything like that. Uh, however, our clubs are paid, so I actually charge a fee uh, for the aftercare for the kids to be in the club. I also tend to discuss, sorry, and talk to various game designers and such at places like Gen Con to see about getting discounts and kind of discussing maybe getting not a sponsorship, but um, working with them to, to have like volunteered supplies. That's not the word. Donated supplies. There we go. Um, manuals and that sort of thing. RJ? Uh, well, I mean, I don't need a whole lot this year because I actually did a GoFundMe and people were very responsive to it. And it was funded within a week. So I basically got to buy everything that I wanted to buy for the club. And on top of that, um, uh, Die Hard Dice and Tabletop Loot uh, both sent me lots of dice, so I'll be sending students home with their own dice, you know, that don't have dice. So I, I really can't complain about lo a lot, you know, uh, unlike uh, kind of like how Stuart mentioned, I don't really have funding from my school for it. And I do this as a volunteer thing, so I don't even get a stipend or anything like that. So I've just made do with very little. But this year, I've got a whole bunch of stuff to use with the students. Um, uh, I had anticipated maybe having three tables worth of students so i have all three of those outfitted i kind of need to make up the slack on that fourth one but i'll just i'll manage you know I'll, I'll do that so i have a lot more than i could have anticipated or asked for before doing the goal fund to me and having people reach out to me in other ways as well so i'm i'm very grateful for those things is the GoFundMe closed uh i don't think i've closed it but after i made my goal i haven't really been pushing it uh at all just because you know, so people were so generous and I was able to get all the things that I was hoping to get for the club. So fair enough. Ruth. I don't really have a GoFundMe for it. There's only five kids there. So I, I have like two PHBs at home that I just bring in for them. Dice, I have an Amazon wish list, but that's more for classroom stuff than for this. So And what's yeah, it we, listed under? Oh, uh, I can't remember. It's on my Twitter. There you go, I folks. Can. Take a look at her Twitter page for that. Uh, and, and that is for both the club and for the classroom, correct? Yeah. Very good. Stuart, what do you think? Um, well, my school was nice and gave me some money to get us started. Um, but uh, as anyone that works with teenagers knows, no, uh, dice go missing. Uh, we're running what? low on supplies. <laughs> um those things start to disappear. We can't, we don't um, charge anything and there's no cost to the students. That's part of the, the selling point. Uh, I'm in a, in a sort of a low socioeconomic area. Um, so anything we offer, I offer at school is uh, free of charge. Um, so any corporate sponsorship would be greatly appreciated and shared around a lot by me and the podcast. There you go. And what is your podcast? Uh, Committee Quest. Okay. Um, 
Uh, late on time, running a little late. Uh, let's do final thoughts. Uh, we'll go in reverse order from where we started. So Stuart, that uh, puts it on your shoulders. Uh, what do you think? Uh, words of wisdom, piece of advice. For people wanting to start a D&D club, uh, jump into it. It's great fun. You get to see kids thrive in a situation. I've got some kids running games. Uh, in fact, all three of my DMs uh, at the moment are absolutely superstars in, in the eyes of their table and having other teachers come in and see that and see these kids and the difference between what they're like in a classroom and what they're like at a D&D table is the best thing. Very good. Ruth, final thoughts. I'm just excited that there are other teachers out there that do this since I'm in such a small community and nobody knows what it is. And I'm really hoping to see what my kids do this year. I have a feeling they're going to surprise you either good or bad. <laughs> Hopefully more good than bad. Yeah. Uh, RJ, final thoughts. Yeah, I'll follow up what Stuart said. You know, if you're thinking about doing it, do it. You know, if you're a teacher and your administrative will support it and administration will just support it, do it. If you're a teacher and your administration doesn't support it or you get pushed back in other ways uh, or you're not a teacher and, you know, you work with kids in some other capacity, you know, for example, I know that all my local libraries have like a D and D group at the libraries as well, you know, so it's not just teachers that can do this. There are other people who can do it in other venues as well. So you can reach out to your local libraries and see if they'll give you, you know, a conference room that might be there, you know, or just a table in a corner somewhere and allow you to run it with kids. So it's, I found it very rewarding and as long as I'm teaching and as long as administrators will allow me to keep doing it, I intend to do it because it really opens up a, a whole kind of a whole new kind of like a uh, way to, to, you know, uh, I bond with your students really, you know, I mean, they start to see you as less of this is just a teacher who come, you know, and stands in front of my class every day or, you know, whatever they start looking at you in a different light and you'll see behaviors change with the students, you know, they'll want to come with you to, to your club. And when they're in your class time, they'll start, you know, if they may be presented some behavioral problems, some of those will, you know, just fall off because they're enjoying the club that they do with you, you know? So mm -hmm. I've seen I a hundred percent agree with that, that, that the relationship building you get out of that, the club is fantastic. Like my yard duties have become a hundred times better because I got kids coming up to me, talking to me about D and D and it's awesome. Very good. Yeah. Danielle, last words. Um, I would say if you want to do a tabletop RPG or a Dungeons and Dragons club, for sure, go for it. Um, I've discovered that, D and D and tabletop RPGs create a sense of community within the school and with the students that you may not have expected was going to happen. It doesn't stay stay in the club. It leaves the club. You see them at lunchtime talking about it. You see them after school talking about it and kids who may never have talked to each other are now chatting and asking you to come to their table and do a, like a quick run through with them. And they invite new people. They just seem like he said, it's, it's the behaviors change. They seem more welcoming. They seem more accepting of other people often. And it's, it's a huge difference, but um, also let the kids lead the narrative, let the kids tell the story, um, let them take it where they want to go. And maybe it'll take you somewhere cool. And also don't be scared to reach out to the online tabletop community. Like talk to those people and those streamers you see online, talk to the people that you see on Twitter and stuff like this because they want to help and they want to be involved in it as well. Just because they're online celebrities or they're getting paid to do this professionally doesn't mean they don't want to be involved within the community. I know um, I have, I moderate for a Twitch channel called hyper RPG and they're very, very open to, to what I do with the kids and they love helping out and stuff too. So just having that support outside of just Twitch and into Twitter and all that is, is immense. It's there. The support's there. You just have to ask. Very good. Uh, kids, if you're watching this and these are your teachers, you are very lucky. Uh, tell them thank you. Uh, and don't ever watch our show again because really you got to be an adult to watch our show. Uh, these four folks were kind enough to give up their time to do this show and they have brought up some very good points. Uh, and I know we've got a lot of different chatters in there. Uh, I know I emailed out the superintendents of our local school systems. Uh, if you guys have any questions, 
uh, these four individuals are an excellent resource uh, to go ahead and use and answer. Uh, you've got everybody from RJ who has way too many kids to Ruth who is probably going to have way too many kids this year or next. Uh, but it's a building moment. Uh, so every one of these uh, folks have said, you know, let it ride. Uh, I'm never going to Vegas with any of these four, but that's fine. Uh, follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive if you want to get RPG crap. I, I, I think we even do bath mats and shower curtains on that website. Uh, incidentally, for you four, if you ever need to run a, a fundraiser, uh, take a look at Threadless. You can open up your own store. Uh, Thank you very much. I cannot stress that enough. If you know how to read, if you know how to do math, you need to thank your teacher because you didn't learn that on your own. Somebody had to teach you that. Uh, teachers are an excellent resource, uh, and I'm going to continue to kiss their butt here uh, after we go off air. Uh, but if you have a question on running it uh, or starting uh, something, hit these four folks up. Uh, they're Twitter feeds are on their rotating nameplates. Uh, if you miss it, uh, do a rerun. Watch it. It'll be on Twitch for a while. It'll be on YouTube this week. Or just hit us up at Murder Hobo Inc. Uh, if you ever want to play a game, no kids, not you guys. Uh, if the adults want to play a game, because it can get a little bit spicy, uh, hit us up. Let us know. We'll try and get you worked in. Other than that, uh, Man, the hour goes fast. Uh, producer, are we ready to make me shut up yet? Yeah, I, I knew we would be ready. Uh, folks, let's give a big wave. Uh, thank you again, folks, for watching us. Woo! -hoo 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 -hoo. Woo!